Laudator Jesus Christus. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Matt Gaspers, Managing Editor of Catholic Family News, and I'm joined as always by my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, who is the Editor-in-Chief of CFN. Hello, Brian. It's good to see you again. I hope you're having a good good month of June so far, and I had a good Pentecost Sunday. Yes, happy Pentecost, yes. So we're in the uh, the octave of Pentecost. We'll get into that in a few minutes in our uh, liturgical segment, but we do have a very packed show for you. I think we've got a lot of interesting topics to discuss today. Uh, first on the docket is Pope Francis's exhortation to members of the Dicastery for Interreligious Dialogue in Rome to, quote, cultivate the spirit and style of conviviality in your relations with people of other religious traditions end quote. And this comes in the wake of what appears to have been an Islamic jihadist massacre of Catholics in Nigeria. So note the extreme irony there. Mm. Secondly, a more liturgical abuse, unfortunately, but not surprisingly, in the Archdiocese of Chicago under Cardinal Blaise Supich, this time featuring a lay homilist, something which is forbidden by canon law. Uh, And it's, it's, I don't even know how to say it. He's playing with a bubble wand during mass. It sounds even more absurd saying it out loud, but that's what happened. We'll show you the footage. Uh, next, we're going to discuss a groundbreaking new documentary film that exposes the insane and dangerous nature of gender ideology. It's called What is a Woman? Um, produced by the Daily Wire and featuring the Daily Wire's Matt Walsh, who was integral in creating the film. And then finally, uh, some much needed hope for the church, for all of us in in these uh, dark and dreary times it feels like we're living in, in the form of this year's Chart pilgrimage in France. So we'll show you some footage and end on a, on a positive note with that story. Hmm. But before we get into all of the news, as always, we'll take a brief look at the church's liturgical calendar and spend a few moments pondering the things that are above, as St. Paul says, and grounding ourselves in the spiritual riches of Holy Mother Church. So we are coming to you on Thursday, June 9th, the year of our Lord, 2022. And as I mentioned, it is we're in the octave of Pentecost, so it's Pentecost Thursday on the traditional Roman calendar. And also uh, the saints uh, Primus and Felician, uh, early martyrs, are commemorated on this day. I just wanted to read, share with you this uh, passage from Dom Guéranger's The Liturgical Year for Today, because it really ties into a lot of our stories today. He writes, quote, The divine spirit has been sent to secure unity to the spouse of Christ. And we have seen how faithfully he fulfills his mission by giving to the members of the church to be one as he himself is one. But the spouse of a God who is, as he calls himself, the truth must be in the truth. This is one of the main themes for our stories today, the truth. And can have no fellowship with error, Garanze writes. Jesus entrusted his teaching to her care and has instructed her in the person of the apostles. He said to them, All things whatsoever I have heard of my Father I have made known to you. And yet, Geranger continues, if left unaided, how can the church preserve free from all change during the long ages of her existence that word which Jesus has not written, that truth which he came from heaven to teach her? And he goes on to say, We have a proof of our Lord's watchful love. In order to realize the wish he had set to, uh, he had had to see us as one, as he and his Father are one, he sent us his Spirit. And in order to keep us in the truth, he sent us this same Spirit who is called the Spirit of Truth. Um, When the Spirit of Truth is come, said he, he will teach you all truth. And what is the truth which the Spirit will teach us? He quotes from St. John's Gospel again. He will teach you all things, as our Lord said, and bring all things to your mind, whatsoever I have said to you. And the last part of this passage says, So that nothing of what the divine word spoke to men is to be lost. The beauty of his spouse is to be based on truth. For beauty is the splendor of truth. So. 
In some, truth matters. As our Lord told Pontius Pilate on the day he was crucified, for this I was born, and for this I came into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So it's interesting, of the truth, it means that there are sides. Some people are of the truth, other people are not. And as you'll recall, Pontius Pilate retorted kind of um, sarcastically or high-mindedly, what is truth? So he sounds like a, yep. a modern relativist. Yep. Keep that in mind when we get to what is a woman, because you're going to see exactly. that uh, come back to haunt us. Exactly. But, uh, beautiful thoughts for for today. Every day having a unique mass here in this week. And then we have two great feasts coming up next week. Uh, Trinity Sunday, the celebration of the most holy and blessed Trinity. Uh, the priests will, in the breviary, recite the uh, the uh, creed of St. Athanasius, which is so infer affirming of the Trinity. And then, of course, next Thursday, the great feast of Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, when in the, the 13th century, the church realized, although there already was a feast of the, the, the body of Christ, the Corpus Christi on Holy Thursday, it's still in Lent. So the ability to celebrate it is muted, obviously, because we're in Passion time. And so the idea was after we're through the whole Easter Pentecost cycle to set aside the Thursday after Trinity Sunday for uh, honoring the Blessed Sacrament, traditionally in public processions to bring the Blessed Sacrament out into the street. The Pope yes. commissioned um, St. Thomas Aquinas to write the propers. So the Laodiceon, the beautiful sequins and the beautiful propers uh, were composed by St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and uh, um, they, there is a privilege in modern times when, when most Catholics have to work and the world doesn't recognize the feast, can't go to mass to externally celebrate. So on the Sunday to have an external meaning outside the actual feast celebration, uh, of the Corpus Christi feast. So you're permitted instead of the, the Sunday, the second Sunday after Pentecost to have the Corpus Christi mass and hold your public procession on Sunday as happened in many, happens in many parishes because of. You know, it's just not possible for people to get there on Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. um, so really a big, big liturgical week. And before we launch into our first story, just wanted to mention an update, which is related to somewhat related to Archbishop uh, Salvatore Cordiglione's barring of Nancy Pelosi from Holy Communion in the Archdiocese of San Francisco. So this week, the bishops of Colorado, my home state, issued a, a, quote, open letter to Catholic politicians and the faithful on worthily receiving communion, in which they state the following, quote, until public repentance takes place and sacramental absolution is received in confession, we ask that those Catholic legislators who live or worship in Colorado and who have voted for RHEA, which stands for the Reproductive Health Equity Act, a pro-abortion bill, here in Colorado that sadly was signed into law on April 4th. So those who voted for that law are to voluntarily refrain from receiving Holy Communion. They go on to say the burden from their decision does not rest upon the shoulders of priests, deacons, or lay extraordinary ministers of the Eucharist. It rests upon the consciences and souls of those politicians who have chosen to support this evil and unjust law. I suppose the one comment we have before moving on would be we're glad that they're asking, uh, you know, immoral politicians to refrain from receiving Holy Communion, but the burden actually does rest on the bishops. That is part of their job as governing the church, the, the role of the bishop to teach, govern, and sanctify. And the same thing with parish priests. Uh, that's part of their duty as governance. I don't know if Brian has anything he wants yeah. to add to that. No, certainly not as good as the decree of uh, Archbishop Cordiglione, but uh, again, it's something, and we should praise it as at least making the point you should not be going to communion, uh, even if not as clear as our, uh, Archbishop Cordiglione. So we commend the bishops, uh, all of them in Colorado, who joined to do this. Yes. All right. So our first story today, as I mentioned in our introduction, has to do with Pope Francis urging what he calls convivial interreligious dialogue. So happy, festive, uh, enjoyable, et cetera, et cetera. 
And he did this on the heels of the massacre in Nigeria, which makes it very ironic. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. So just to give you the background of what happened here, members and consultors of the Dicastery for Interreligious Dialogue held a plenary assembly June 6th through 8th, so earlier this week, at the Vatican. <clears throat> and remember, this is now called a dicastery instead of it used to be the Pontifical Council, and that is because uh, Pope Francis's apostolic constitution on curial reform, the reform of the Roman Curia, went into effect on Sunday, uh, Pentecost Sunday, June 5th. So this egalitarian model of everything's the same there's no real hierarchy even though they're tech they're really in practice is but every office is now called a dicastery for some crazy reason so according to a vatican press release issued june 4th uh this plenary assembly which just means a, a gathering of all the members and con uh, consultants for the the uh, dicastery the plenary assembly is always a joyful and timely occasion to reflect on the current situation of interreligious dialogue in various parts of the world and to explore further what the role of the Christian community should be in converting the world. Nope. It says in promoting conviviality and fraternity among members of different religious traditions so that they may contribute to the good of all humanity. Funny, I don't recall Jesus mentioning uh, promoting conviviality and fraternity among members of different religious traditions. He said to go teach all nations and baptize them. So <clears throat> that's kind of the first uh, point to remember for this story. So on the first day of the Dicastery's two-day meeting, which was started on Monday this week, June 6th, the theme of the meeting was interreligious dialogue and conviviality. Pope Francis addressed the members and consultors. We're going to read a few quotes and comment on them. So he opened by saying, quote, I am pleased to meet you on the occasion of the plenary session of the Dicastery for Interreligious Dialogue, the day after the Solemnity of Pentecost. I emphasize this because St. Paul VI announced the birth of the, quote, Secretariat for Non-Christians non in his homily on the day of Pentecost, 1964, during Vatican Council II. He did so before the promulgation of the Declaration Nostra Aetate on the relations between the church and non-Christian religions. Uh, fun side note on that, that was actually composed by an open homosexual uh, named Father... Baum, B-A-U-M, and Francis goes on, and before the encyclical Ecclesium Suum considered the Magna Carta of dialogue in its various forms. He says, how far the spirit has brought us in these 60 years, end quote. Yeah, that's <laughs> quite an understatement, although uh, it's certainly not the Holy Ghost doing these things. We, know, <laughs> we can all... Uh, surmise what spirit is leading leading these innovations these uh, departures from tradition so for those who may not be familiar with paul the uh, sixth 1964 encyclical ecclesium suum which was actually subtitled on the church so it's interesting that francis calls it the magna carta of interreligious dialogue i was reading through it the other day preparing for the show and found some interesting quotes that i'd like to share with you so this one says, this is from the document number 64, quote, merely to remain true to the faith is not enough, says Paul VI. Certainly we must preserve and defend the treasure of truth and grace that we have inherited through Christian tradition, but neither the preservation nor the defense of the faith exhausts the duty of the church in regard to the gifts it has been given. The very nature of the gifts, he says, which Christ has given the church demands that they be extended to others and shared with others. That's certainly true. We're called to go out and share the gospel and convert souls. Uh, he says, this must be obvious from the words, going therefore teach ye all nations, Christ's final command to his apostles. To this internal drive of charity, which seeks expression in the external gift of charity, we will apply the word dialogue. And that's really the problem, because dialogue is not 
the mission of the church to go out and preach the gospel and convert souls dialogue the, the word itself means two people speaking to each other having a conversation that's not what the mission of the church is he goes on paul the sixth goes on to say the church must enter into dialogue with the world in which it lives it has something to say a message to give a communication to make yeah it has a divinely revealed truth the deposit of faith to communicate and to draw souls to christ yes so i had come to mind after reading that some words from a professor romano amerio who was a very distinguished layman uh, before the second vatican council he was actually asked by paul or excuse me john the 23rd to be on the central preparatory commission for the council uh, as a more traditional minded uh, lay theologian lay scholar and he says in his book iota unum which i highly recommend getting a copy if you haven't read this book it's very important reading for anyone interested in the traditional catholic faith so he says in in the chapter on uh, ecumenism into religious dialogue quote the word dialogue represents the biggest change in the mentality of the church after the council only comparable in its importance with the change wrought by the word liberty in the last meaning the 19th century he wrote his book i think it was published in 1996 um, the word was completely unknown and unused in the church's teaching before the council it did not occur once in any previous council or in papal encyclicals or in sermons or in pastoral practice in the Vatican II documents, Professor Mario observes, it occurs 28 times, 12 of them in the decree on ecumenism, Unitatis Redintegratio. Nonetheless, through its lightning spread and enormous broadening in meaning, this word, which is very new in the Catholic Church, became the master word determining post-conciliar thinking and a catch-all category in the newfangled mentality. I don't know if Brian had anything he wanted to add. I know he's a big fan of Professor Amerio's book. Yes, de definitely highly recommended. But I mean, this is the the irony where we are uh, that the you know this clear religious massacre. And uh, you know, I agree with the, your comment. These were these were martyrs martyred very clearly, openly. And this is not the first. There are priests, bishops, Catholics. Uh, throughout Africa that are being attacked for years. And, you know, Liz Nior has done great work on this, bringing attention to great attacks on and persecution of Catholics and Christians in the, in the modern world. And, yes. you know, what do we get more of what's produced this? So 50 years of dialogue has not brought peace and fraternity. It's, right. it's not brought anything. It hasn't brought converts, and it has, certainly hasn't brought peace. Uh, right. This, If anyone should be standing up, not... You know, talking about conviviality, but but condemning and calling on the world to condemn who doesn't care about, again, frankly, it's both discriminatory and it's racist. They really, I just think, don't care about you know, all of these African you know, these people in Nigeria were just massacred uh, at all. The mainstream news media, zero, right. almost no attention to this. And, you know, where is the voice of the church? Where is the yes. church in, in all this? And speaking of that, so Francis said in his address to the dicastery, quote, this is your mission to promote with other believers in a fraternal and convivial manner the journey in search of God, considering people of other religions not in an abstract way, but in a real sense with a history, desires, sufferings, and dreams. Only in this way can we build together a world everyone may inhabit in peace. Well, maybe you should tell that to the people in Nigeria. Yes. Uh, and, and my question is, what about the church's actual mission of saving souls? Yes. Contrary to the Pope's implication with this statement, the church is not a fellow traveler with, with other believers, meaning adherents of false religions, who are in search of God. She is the mystical body of Christ, constituted and commissioned by her divine head, who is himself the definitive revelation of God, to call all men to conversion, not conviviality. The church yes. is not in search of God. She is his spouse, as right. well as the infallible guardian and teacher of his revelation. 
So it's and it's a basis. very short journey to God. It's called the Catholic Church. Yes, exactly there's, there's, right. It's not it's not complicated. Right. Well, from corrupted doctrine to corrupted liturgy, as uh, you know, the, the the law of prayer is the law of belief. Uh, that leads us in real to our next story, which is uh, yet more liturgical abuse under the watch of Cardinal Supich, freshly appointed, nominated to the Congregation for Divine Worship. This, what you're about to hear, goes on in his diocese, yet he's supposed to be watching out for liturgy around the world. Um, we've already shown you abuse. We showed you that horrific, back at Christmas time, horrific Christmas mm -hmm. spectacle. Uh, this is actually at a different parish uh, in Chicago. Um, that, so it's not just limited. It's not just, oh, it's just one place. It's that place. Uh, no, this is... Um, a Father Terrence Keehan, uh, in again, Archdiocese of, of uh, Chicago, uh, but he's in Inverness, Inverness part, and it's Holy Family Catholic Community. I don't know why it's called church, but Holy, Catholic, Holy, Holy Family Catholic Community in Inverness, and again, it's Father uh, Keehan. This Father Keehan, give you a little background again, this isn't a one-off either, either. In the past, past, he has blessed the congregation with a guitar, saying, Quote, loving God, rock with us as we roll with you. <laughs> affirm us so that we may affirm others. Sing your song in us that we may sing it with others. Um, and as Matt was pointing out before the show, you know, it's, it's odd to even call it a mass. As you can guess, that's not a prayer in the Roman uh, missile. <laughs> not uh, even in he, the Novus Ordo. <laughs> not even in the Novus Ordo. And he doesn't even use a Roman missile. He's got his own text and a kind of three ring binder that he's reading out of. So uh, really, this is, again, not a one off. So what happened last weekend? Uh, a, a gentleman who is a layman, not a cleric uh, in any way, uh, definitely not a cleric, not a deacon, Mr. Terry Nelson Johnson gave a homily. And again, this is not just me saying he's giving a homily. He called it a homily. Multiple he said, times, I mean, yes. multiple times, I'm the homilist. I'm giving a homily. And I'm going to play a little bit of a clip from it. Uh, before it's just very bizarre. If you watch the whole thing, it's just it, it, it's frankly not. I mean, it's it's sacrilegious and but it's not even interesting. I mean, it's not even worthwhile he tells a whole story about how he's at the beach and he meets these people and he wants to play with their bubble wand uh, <laughs> a grown man <laughs> a grown man and that's where we pick up on sitting yes. in what one can only imagine was bubble solution i'm not sure what came over me i walked over and said do you mind if i make a few bubbles they both nodded in affirmation and so i went over and the relevance the of this is, yeah. <laughs> Stirred up the solution a little bit. And I don't know if this is going to work, but it's a good try. <laughs> huh? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh, I'm pretty sure this is the first time this has happened at the feet of the cross of new life. I noticed uh, that sitting next to them was a... Uh, I hope so. I hope it's not only the first, but also the last. Yeah. I mean, again, that is supposed to be a sanctuary of a Catholic church. Is that an appropriate... I mean, what is that teaching children about appropriate behavior yep. uh, in church. Well, if you think, okay, it can't get any worse. <laughs> well, if you watch this whole thing, it does. Uh, at the end, they decide to uh, have a dance party to cool in the gangs celebrate. Uh, after which they said, or earlier, which they, they sang Cindy Lauper's Time After Time, that great Gregorian classic. No, so. Yeah. Uh, so here's the towards the end of Mass. And the sound, I think, is a little bit down, but they're all, you know, it's very loud. They're all dancing 
loudly. And the guy with the bubble guy was literally takes off his jacket and starts shaking it like a I don't know what. <laughs> and he's telling them to shake it in church. And you got the priest. All right, we're going to stop it there. Uh, yeah. He's now doing a striptease act. The, the, <laughs> the, the homilist. Uh, again, with a, a priest standing right there, you know, getting down. Uh, again, the volume was a little low on that clip, but uh, playing Celebrate. Uh, I, again, aside from all the abuse there, uh, this is a clear and direct violation of canon law. It Only a priest or an ordained deacon may preach a homily at right. mass that is current not just 1917 code that right. is canon law that is a direct violation of canon law by terry nicholas johnson and the priests that allowed him to do it now in the novus ordo they skirt the edge of that rule and at funerals which are not or celebrations of life they do allow the priest gives a sermon and sometimes they allow a eulogy at the end which is really not which is really kind of on the gray line of that. I mean, this is way over the line. This is not a eulogy right. after mass, which is not, not really permitted by lay people, but this is, and again, he calls himself a homilist. This is a direct violation of Canon law. Cardinal Supage, where are you? Where are you? You're busy canceling every traditional mass this past Sunday, Pentecost. You couldn't go to a, Unless you went to a Society of St. Pius X Mass, you couldn't go to a traditional Catholic Mass in his archdiocese because he forbids them right. on Pentecost, among other other days. And remember, he said in relation to his uh, decrees uh, on Traditionis Custodis, Supage, I close by recalling the insightful observation of Pope Benedict XVI when he issued some more in Pontificum. The surest guarantee that the Missal of Paul VI can unite parish communities and be loved by them consists in its being celebrated with great reverence. Uh, yep, he used that word, with great reverence in, uh, sorry, something just popped in up on my computer, covered in, up, harmony. in harmony with the liturgical directives. This will bring out the spiritual richness and the theological depth <clears throat> sick of this missile sorry email popped up over what i was reading uh so yeah obviously he's really concerned about theological correctness canon law reverence reverence and this goes on and again it's not a one-off it's not that this is just one thing we've been documenting this before we did it the other parish at christmas this yes. has happened the guitar blessing this and, I've and seen it's all not also it. recently just cropping up in the last couple of years i had somebody uh, respond to my tweet about this saying they left this particular parish 25 years ago for this kind of stuff it's been going on yes. for decades Yes, and he does zero about it, but he suppresses the traditional mass ruthlessly, uh, ruthlessly. Well, that none of that. And again, you all may be saying this isn't fair. This isn't authorized by the missile. This is not liturgical norm that Vatican II required. But this is really where Vatican II went with liturgy. Yes, he, they're going further, but what they would say is we're going in the logical direction. We're completing Vatican II. Vatican II, the new mass, is filled with ad lib. And these are similar words. The priest can choose this. He can decide to do that. You can write your own new Eucharistic prayers. I remember Paul VI said, uh, you know, the Fev said, well, isn't there four or six of them? He says, oh, I think there's like 10 times that now. The whole <laughs> right opens itself up for innovation, change, uh, and a constant, constant updating. And, and therefore, the very spirit of the new liturgy is this same spirit that you just saw. It is, that's what it's enculturation. That's enculturation into 1970s, 80s culture. They're always like a couple of days behind, but that's what that is. And this is exactly what Armani Romero said in talking about liturgical reform. He says, the motivation underlying the reform, meaning the liturgical, liturgical reform, combines various significant departures from traditional thinking, all of them connected with an incipient change in doctrine. The first change comes from supposing that the liturgy should give expression to the feelings of modern man. 
celebrate. Sorry, that's yeah. that's not my feelings, but I guess that's their their feelings of modern man. When in fact it is designed to express the timeless vision of the church. According to the classic definition repeated by the council, the liturgy is the priestly action of Christ and his mystical body. No, no sense of that in that clip. He goes on to say the new liturgy is thus psychological. Very, very key point. The new liturgy is thus psychological rather than ontological. It's about feelings, emotions, and not about being, reality. Right subjective rather than objective anthropologic rather than theological and expresses so not so much a transcend transcendent mystery as the feelings with which people react to that mystery the principle of creativity stems from this false presupposition that the liturgy ought to express the feelings of the faithful and that it is something that they themselves produce what it really expresses is the mystery of Christ, Christ being the true source of the liturgy. This new view implicitly reduces the liturgy to the level of poetry. So notice... Or popular culture would be another way of saying Popular it. culture. Notice here, what he's saying is the liturgy is something objective. It's something truthful. It's something real. It's not what we identify it as. It's not what we say it is. We don't make it. It is given and received, and we either do it. We either do it well or we do it poorly, but we have no control over the reality of what it is, which is uh, a perfect segue into our next story where, yes. once again, uh, popular culture wants to make think they have control of reality. Exactly. And just another note of tying the stories to the next one is the uh, Holy Family Catholic community is also very LGBT friendly. They actually have a page on their website called One in Love LGBT Ministry, which leads us into our next story, which is about this new documentary film called What is a Woman? Uh, produced by Matt Walsh and The Daily Wire. And I was not all that familiar with Matt Walsh's work before this. I, I had heard the name um, and I'd heard of the Daily Wire, of course, but I don't read it all that often. But I was very impressed with this documentary film. I watched it in full yesterday with my wife. We both uh, thought it was very well done. And, you know, what it comes down to ultimately, basically he's trying to expose and he did a very good job of doing so the insanity and the dangerous nature of gender ideology which gender ideology can basically be summed up by by reject and a rejection of objective reality and trying to say reality can be whatever you want it to be just like the people at at that parish think that they can make the mass and the faith whatever they want it to be mm -hmm. Um, so there's a good review, a written review of the film at LifeSite News that came out a few days ago. Uh, the headline is Matt Walsh's documentary, What is a Woman, is a groundbreaking expose of transgender lies. And going back to what we discussed in the introduction about the importance of truth and, and Pilate's uh, question, kind of snarky question to our Lord, what is truth? Well, it's very simple definition. and St. Thomas Aquinas repeats the classic definition in his Summa and elsewhere. In Latin, it is veritas est adequatio, adequatio rei et intellectus, which basically means the correspondence of one's mind with objective reality. That is the definition of truth. And the definition of a woman is equal, is very simple as well. It, you know, according to what you would call metaphysical realism, which is basically what Thomism is, it's interacting with reality as it is, not as we want it to be. A woman is an adult female member of the human race. And yet all these supposed experts that Mr. Walsh goes around the country uh, interviewing, uh, among whom are what a, a licensed marriage and family therapist, uh, a medical doctor, OBGYN, who uh, is actually a biological male who had did a sex had a sex change operation himself and now identifies as a female um, and does these surgeries for other people. Uh, another medical doctor who's a pediatrician as well as an abortionist and, and I, I, a social. I, I, go ahead. 
Oh, oh yeah, we actually have a clip from part of the interview with her that I want to play because oh, it, yes. it it really what he does is great. I mean, he mostly just goes and asks questions. The best is right. he goes to the women's march. Yes. And he says you're you're at a women's march. What what is a woman? And they're like, he's like, well, why are you here if you don't even know what it is? But anyway, he just starts asking her some questions and just exposes, again, the dead end nature of this ultimate, you know, subjectivism and, and how it's, it's so nonsensical. Is sitting down with you is questioning yeah. their gender. What's the gender affirmation process? Affirmation means that as a pediatrician, as someone who says my job is to provide the best medical care for you, is I need to listen really carefully. And how I put it in words for kids so that they can understand it is, tell me your story. Where have you been in terms of your gender and your gender identity? Where are you right now? And more excitingly, where would you like to be in the future? Have you ever met a four-year-old who believes in Santa Claus? Mm hmm So this is someone who believes that a fat man is traveling through the sky on a flying reindeer at lightning speed coming down his chimney with presents. Yeah. Would you say that this is someone who maybe has a tenuous grasp on reality? <laughs> they have an appropriate four-year-old handle on the sure. reality Agreed. that's very real for them. Agreed. Agreed. But Santa Claus is real for them, but yeah. this is not actually real. Yeah, well, and, but Santa Claus does deliver their Christmas presents. Well, yeah, but he's not real, though. To that child, they are. <laughs> when I see a child who, you know, believes in Santa Claus, and then, let's say this is a boy, and he says, I'm a girl. Mm -hmm. This is someone who can't distinguish between fantasy and reality, so how could you take that as a reality? I would say that as a pediatrician and as a parent, I would say how wonderful my four-year-old and their imagination is. You know, one of the hardest... <laughs> <laughs> I can't, wow. that's just uh, what's absurd. She, he backs her into a corner, it's beautiful, to where she has to say, oh, well, oh, yes, Santa Claus exists. <laughs> He's real. Right. Uh, right. It's just and, it, it's, and it's the same. Beautiful. You got the same response from people on the street in California and elsewhere. I mean, it's it's scary to think that there are, that are people out there who think that if you think something is real, it's real for you. Like we all just live in. Speaking of bubbles, we're all just in our own little bubble, and we can make up our own reality, and it has no effect on other people. It's insane. It's insane. Mm -hmm. Um, well, his his interviewees did not take things very well, and and a lot of them ended uh, badly because again he backs them into corners. She was pretty good; she kept going, and she gets even worse and worse in her right. kind of digging herself into a hole. Uh, but we have another clip. Uh, I think with this, this with uh, do you want to introduce this one? Yeah. This so this clip? is yeah. a a doctor Patrick. Uh, forgive me if I butcher the last name Grzanka. It's G R Z A N K A a professor of women, gender, and sexuality studies at the University of Tennessee. Imagine this man gets paid probably a, a healthy salary to teach this garbage. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And so, yeah, you'll see what he says when, when uh, speaking of the issue of truth, objective truth, that's what Mr. Walsh brings up. And this is the response that he gets. I'm not even University talking about social context. I'm just, I'm just trying to start by getting to the truth, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm really uncomfortable with that language of like, <laughs> getting to the truth again in social why, why life. Is that, why is that uncomfortable? Because that it sounds actually deeply transphobic to me. Um, and, if you, and, and if you keep <laughs> probing, we're going to stop the interview. I, if I probe about what the truth is? You keep invoking the word truth, which is condescending and rude. I'm saying how to is, you. How is the word truth condescending and rude? Why don't you tell me what your truth is and you're walking on. <laughs> 30 seconds more of the nights before I get up. What my truth is that we I, I can't know the word truth is, I can't forget how many insults he threw. Rude, trans, condescending uh, and rude. Condescending, yeah. all right, uh, transphobic. <laughs> uh, just by saying, I'm just trying to get to the truth here. Like, I'm just trying to, right. that's insulting. And notice, and notice the threat. I have no answer for you, so I'm going to get up and leave. That's right. the only answer. <laughs> yeah, as Matt Walsh has said in um, describing the the movie or the film, uh, a recurring theme with all of these pro LGBT people he interviewed was fear and anger, uh, re which obviously that's what happens when you don't have a, a rational answer to defend yourself. You start getting afraid and you get anxious and ultimately you burst out in anger. So 
essentially what what this professor and others said who who believe in this fantasy world of of lgbt transgenderism uh their answer to the question what is a woman is essentially a woman is a person who identifies as a woman that's literally what they say instead of the the reality a, a woman is an adult female member of the human race and again, it comes back, you know, beyond the biological question, what is a woman, lies this deeper philosophical question, what is truth? And as we've said, it is the correspondence of one's mind with objective reality. So what these people, what the insidious nature of gender ideology is really the fact that they hold and teach that reality can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, in other words, it rejects reality, namely divine and natural law. That's what they're angry at. They're angry at the fact that what they want is unnatural and condemned by God and by our own nature. Hmm. And what they want is fantasy. And ultimately, it repeats the lie of the devil that man can be his own God, his own arbiter of reality. Yes. So when you start yes. to poke and to prod that delusion, that's when they start to get angry. I, and again, it's it's you go back to that. She can't even say, well, yes, yeah, Santa Claus is just you know is this thing is this story this nice thing for kids. She has to kind of cling to it instead of St. Paul. You know, and as a child, I did said the things of a child. Now that I'm a man, I've put away the things of a child. Right? right. They want to live in perpetual childhood, where again, children do have an imagination. They have to learn the difference between reality and fantasy. And, you know, if they don't, that's how we end up with tragedies, you know, right. shootings. You know, that's how people have psychological problems. They right. are no longer playing games. They're they're realizing it's they don't realize this is not just a fantasy in my mind. I'm now actually going out and doing horrible things. They're trapped in a sort of child inability to distinguish reality from from fantasy. And another great part with that one woman, the the abortionist pediatrician which is an oxymoron um yeah. says he says well what if there's like, i see a chicken laying eggs and i say well that's a female chicken i, I mean am i just not recognizing reality she's like no you're assigning right. it a gender it's right like, that's what? the other thing that's the other part of this lie is that they say that you're assigned yes. a gender at birth as opposed to the doctor simply observing what is there and yes. and course you know making the pronouncement uh, accordingly Yes. I think the most powerful interviewee, at least in my opinion, is the uh, biological male who, you know, attempted to trans transition into a male uh, he, and goes by the name of Scott Nugent. Uh, as, as Matt Walsh says himself in a tweet, Matt Nugent is the hero of the film. Such a mm. remarkable contrast between the raw openness and honesty in this interview and the evasiveness and defensiveness from the, quote, experts I spoke to. This man, mm. uh, this woman technically, but presents as, a, you know, looks and sounds masculine, um, is basically giving powerful and passionate testimony that this this is wrong, as as she says, on multiple levels and sounding the alarm, this is dangerous. This is butchering healthy children and mm. con trying to convince them that surgery and dangerous, harmful drugs are the answer to their problem, and it's not. And she knows from personal experience Living. that it's yes. not. Yes. So really, we congratulate Matt uh, Walsh for what he did, for bringing this, uh, the bravery to bring this forward. And you can, uh, it is exclusively showing on the Daily Wire. I believe you have to subscribe to one of their plans to be able to watch it. Uh, right. But it, it definitely is a, a, a great contribution uh, that, that is worth, uh, worth your time. So we, we both yes. recommend it. And I mean, it might well, be available in DVD at some point too, or something. I thought I saw an ad on Amazon or something, so that might be worth looking into. Yes, it it might be. It might be. Right. Well, let's end with some good news. Uh, this year was the 40th anniversary of the uh, Pèlerinage de Chartres. Uh, it began 40 years ago, 1982, uh, and it is extra special because it it didn't happen for two years. Uh, because for the past two years, France civil authorities wouldn't allow it because of the COVID thing. Uh, what is it? Well, it started in the 80s. A group of traditional Catholics walked from the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris to Notre Dame 
in Chartres, uh, one of the most beautiful cathedrals in, in Europe, uh, that houses the relic of the, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, her veil, uh, her veil, which she wore during the nativity, giving birth to our Lord. Uh, her veil was uh, brought there by Charles the Bald in the year 900 and has been housed in Chartres uh, since then. And uh, their idea for the pilgrimage, they followed on uh, in medieval times when the students in Paris, their classes, this the Lent term of classes, to celebrate, they would go on a pilgrimage to Chartres to thank Our Lady. And this would happen every year around this time. And so they follow in their, their footsteps. Uh, for many, many years, they arrived in Chartres and the doors were closed in their face. They were welcomed with a slammed door. Uh, and did not uh, did not and had mass outside outside the cathedral. Um, this year, after two years and after all we've been through, it was one of the largest pilgrimages uh, there on the. And there are actually now two pilgrimages because after 1988, the pilgrimage divided, uh, and the Society of Saint Pius the Tenth leads a parallel pilgrimage over the same weekend from Chartres to Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, Lee starting in Chard and going into Paris. They, 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 I remember when I was on it, they passed by maybe within 50 feet of each other at, at one point. But the Chard Paris was about 15 to 18,000 people I've seen. And, you know, another uh, large group, I haven't seen estimates yet, for, but it's usually five, ten thousand 10,000 on the, the society's one. Uh, and what's interesting is on the Chard Paris statistic, and while I'm um, talking, I'm actually going to roll through, they have some... Um, pictures that uh, from this year uh, it was brutal the weather there was torrential you can see they're walking through there uh, rain uh, and hail apparently uh, but uh, this year there the of the 15 to 18 thousand, over half of them were under the age of 20 because they do take registration so they have information but mm -hmm. over half of them are under the age of 20. And wow. remember, this is in a church where uh, statistics, the Catholic Church all over, particularly the Western world in France, the generation under 30 and under 20 has lost the faith. They're, they don't believe in God. There's, there's, they have no religion. Uh, they're, you know, they have uh, completely lost it. And uh, here you have you know, over half of them, so you know, eight, 9,000 maybe, uh, are under 20 years old. And they're walking through, again, you get a sense of how bad mm -hmm. the weather was, how big those puddles were. I know the year 2000 when I was, was one of the, supposedly one of the most brutal years because it was very hot. It was like 90 degrees, which was unusual. And there were torrential rains right before. So all the fields were full of mud. And so you were trudging through deep mud, mm -hmm. I remember, and, and roasting. Uh, that was supposed to be the worst year. Everyone told me, oh, you picked the worst year as my first one. Um, <laughs> but it sounds like this year was was much, much worse. So that's uh, a look at just some of the uh, pictures from the organization Notre, Notre Dame de Chrétienité, which is an incredible organization. The organization for this, I'm going to move this many people 70 miles. They have campsites, they have uh, medical tents, feed all the people uh, is, is really quite, quite extraordinary. And then they arrive in Chartres, uh, the little medieval town, beautiful medieval town, uh, on the Monday. And here is a, from someone's phone, it appears, uh, a, a look at the uh, entrance into the cathedral. It's so large, the, the group, that I, I got in the cathedral a couple of years, but almost half the people have to sit outside. They can't even mm -hmm. get in. I mean, they, they pack you every inch of room in the cathedral. But even with that, they can't even fit them in. There's just no more room. And so they have a big TV screen outside. Uh, that's how many people there are. A cathedral-sized church can't hold them all. Uh, but and the other thing that's going on at the church, remember there's a vocations crisis. There's no priests. Right. Uh, in France, it's a, a severe crisis of uh, no priests. But just take a look, and we don't have time to watch the whole thing. Here is the procession in. Again, we're seeing the, the end of the pilgrims coming. I love seeing all the flags and standards. Yes. And again, look at the ages of everybody going by. I imagine there's been quite a few vocations as a result of going on that pilgrimage. Let me jump ahead a little bit. Oh, 
the scouts, the French scouts you see there. Notice how they're not playing cool in the game. No. <laughs> <laughs> Blue vest people are all workers that work again. They have a whole workforce that work the pilgrimage to make it prepared. There we go. The beginning of the priestly procession. Those look like some Dominicans, maybe. Ah, uh, they look like it. Yes. age of the clergy is also very encouraging, very young. Exactly. Not only the numbers, but again, if you look at, they're of all ages, obviously, but predominantly young. Uh, they may be Institute of Christ the King, I think. All young, young. And now this procession goes on from 1014 to, so for seven minutes, there are priests walking. So if I kept, you'd have to watch seven minutes to see the wow. bishop arrive. That's how long uh, it takes to get them, get them all in. And there's a priest shortage. They have, you know, priests in Paris and France, you know, serving multiple churches. There's obviously a lot of priests, but not the ones uh, they want. Here's another clip from their official video at the, uh, uh, the cathedral. Just a sense of how packed the cathedral is. Wow. And again, you're just literally, you have, there's no pews, nothing. You're just packed in. Looks like there's troops, still uh, troops assembled for battle, is what it reminds uh, me of. Yes. You can see, and they're already, you know, back to the doors. And then each of the banners is. Uh, of the chapitre. So you walk in a little group of maybe 20 or 30, uh, and then each chapitre has its own its own banner um, mm -hmm. that represents them. And so then they're bringing in all the banners from all the different chapitres. They have a whole separately organized children uh, for the chapitre enfant for children, which uh, is not even in the main pilgrimage. So when they, they're there, because they have walk, obviously a shorter walk, but thousands and thousands of children. Uh, young scouts who carry the statue of Our Lady of Chartres, the whole 70 miles, they carry her at the front, uh, usually running. They're, they usually uh, <laughs> run ahead of the, uh, the pilgrimage. Uh, and again, Catholicism is alive and well, uh, if you know where to look for. And I would just say to, to Pope Francis, looks like a lot of rigid people there, I guess. <laughs> very rigid, very, very, very uh, rigid. So, uh, really, congratulations to Notre Dame de Chrétienité for yet another uh, successful. We're happy it's back. Two years having lost it is uh, is greatly disappointing, but uh, really wonderful uh, that you were able to restore it this year. And it really is a great place for young people to meet uh, other Catholics. I remember one year I walked. Uh, I, I tended to be a, a, a freelance pilgrim. I, I, I joined, I would like move from group to group. So I, I walked with the Americans a little bit with the English, the Australians. They were great. The Australians were a lot of fun. But I, I remember once uh, ran into a, um, uh, a girl and her father and a couple other people um, from uh, Denmark. They had a little Danish flag they were carrying. And I said, oh, well, you know, why are you here? What brought you here? And they basically, well, there's just so few Catholics in Denmark. We're so alone. And, and we heard about this and we just wanted to spend three days around other Catholics. And this has just been so inspiring. And I know she met people. She got a lot of addresses, email addresses and phone numbers and, and kept in contact with them. So it is, mm -hmm. you know, really uh, and not just for the youth. I, I remember you know, once when I was about to pass out, being passed like an 80 year old. You know, <laughs> What's the matter, Sonny? Keep you know, to keep up. But uh, <laughs> it, uh, it, it is it is dominated by uh, by the by the youth, the scouts. Uh, it's wonderful. One last quick story uh, that I learned when I was yes. there. I mentioned to you because to me, it's a wonderful example of God's providence, how God uh, is in control of history. 
So the, the veil of the Blessed Virgin Mary is there, is in shot. Uh, and it was there for centuries. It was wrapped, kept wrapped up and kept in a glass reliquary. So you could look at it, but you couldn't actually see it. It wasn't, it was folded up. You just saw one fold mm -hmm. of it. And uh, over time, the people kind of forgot what it looked like. Um, so, you know, they hadn't seen it opened up. And so they thought that it wasn't a, a veil. They actually thought it was a, a cloak, a camisa in, mm. in French. And they called it the Sancta Camisa. They thought it was really the dress of the Blessed Virgin. And so you'll see actually in chart on different parts, there's little pictures of a little dress that's all over the cathedral if you look. And so what happened was in the, in the revolution, so they, they called it that, they referred to it, the time of the revolution came and the revolutionaries broke into Chart and they wanted to burn the relic. So they mm. smashed the reliquary and they took it out and they brought it out and they were going to throw it in the fire. But when they opened it up, they realized it wasn't a shirt or a dress, it was a veil. And they said, oh, these stupid Catholics, they've been, they thought this was a veil and they were wrong all these years. Let's keep this to show them how stupid they are. And it's only because of that that the veil of the Blessed Virgin, the only relic we have, was not hmm. destroyed. If that wow. historical mistake, if people hadn't done that, the veil would have been cast in the fire like so many relics in France. And again, to me, it's the beauty of God's providence. He allows this mistake in people's understanding of what's behind the reliquary to happen so as to preserve it from destruction from the revolutionaries, to preserve yes. it would, did not want his mother's veil uh, defiled. But it's... Uh, really, if you can get to Chart, if you can see the pilgrimage, it's 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 uh, wonderful. But it, even if you can get to the cathedral to see the relic, see the the beautiful stained glass, uh, the uh, it is one of the most ancient sites. The underground crypt church of Notre Dame de Souterre was the first church. It was a pagan uh, temple that was turned by the first Christians in the first centuries into a Christian church, and then Chart was built on top. So really wonderfully inspiring to see the faith flourishing, notwithstanding traditionis custodes, which we know will not succeed. I mean, it will hurt people. No. There will be harm. There will be pain, but the mass will never be stamped out. It will not be stamped out because it is of God. As you know, the Jews, as uh, the Jews said, if this is of God, there's nothing we can do. If it is of men, it will die. The mass is of God and will never be completely stamped out. And the pilgrims right. there give great witness to that. Absolutely. All so right. what a, we had a packed show. Um, yes. Before we go, an important public service announcement. Uh, we will not have a weekly news roundup uh, next week. Uh, which would be on the 16th, uh, and I'll, I guess I'll explain. So I will be traveling to Virginia uh, next week for the ordination, which I've mentioned before, of our, our oldest son, uh, Reverend Mr. Uh, Cormac McCall, who will be, as of next Friday, Father Cormac McCall. Uh, so uh, we just, given the bad internet in the, the seminary vicinity there, I was probably just not going to work to do a... Uh, a show. So we will be here in two weeks, but that's where I will, uh, that's the reason. And maybe I can ask you uh, next week uh, to pray particularly for my son. He, he started his uh, ordination retreat today uh, and uh, he will be on retreat. So the next time we speak to him will be after the ceremony uh, when he gives us his first blessing oh, wow. uh, so please pray for him uh you know the devil you know doesn't like ordination of priests they are seminarians are persecuted throughout their seminary uh career uh and you know i don't know what will be in store for him on this retreat in his last last seven days the devil has to try to derail this but uh so please uh pray for him because it will be an intense last several days um I'm sure that uh, all goes well and that he is ordained uh, next Friday. If you want to watch the ceremony, the St. Thomas Aquinas Seminary, stas.org. If you go to their YouTube channel, go to their website or their YouTube channel, you can mm -hmm. find a link for the, uh, for the, the ceremony. It starts at 9 a.m. on June uh, the 17th. There are six deacons to be ordained and then I think two subdeacons to be ordained deacons. So that's yes. the reason we will be back in two weeks, but uh, please, if you can remember that in your prayers. Yes. As well as remember to like this video, share on social media with your family and friends, and please consider subscribing to Catholic Family News, our monthly publication. Visit catholicfamilynews.com. Uh, for information on how to sign up. We just, the June paper is out. It's full of great content. So you won't want to miss out. 
And we will close as we always do with uh, invoking Our Lady in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer thee the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the instruments of his holy passion, that thou mayest put division in the camp of thy enemies. For as thy beloved Son has said, a kingdom divided against itself shall fall. Our Lady of Chartres, pray for us. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, wish you a, a happy uh, Corpus Christi and uh, Feast of the Holy Trinity, and we'll see you in uh, two weeks. God bless you.